the thing is that obviously uh, we have some God's honest issues to, 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 to work on at the local level, um, emergency management and everything else, and you can't unfortunately cook any to your own decoration. This is the Gomaluku Podcast. The next question I have is for Ghazali. Ghazali, what are the necessary steps towards, sorry, what are the necessary steps forward towards achieving enhanced participation at the United Nations? Well, thank you for, for your question. I also like thank you kind of for like setting the stage a little bit. I have no slides, so you probably have to listen to my late night radio DJ FM voice. <laughs> um, but it's um, when it, when I when I heard the 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 whole the topic of this meeting was out in sustainable development goals, I had a flashback to um, July 19, 2014. Um, as you probably know, sustainable development goals. Before that, you had the Millennium Development Goals. So they had to like repackage it, relabel it, put a sticker on it, put some lipstick on it, and they call it sustainable development development goals. But that was a process. That was a long process. Just a question. How many references to indigenous peoples are there in Sustainable Development Goals? Just shout a number. Zero. Zero? Anyone higher? No, he can't go lower, but... <laughs> <laughs> like more? Like, how, how many references do you think? Just, just shout a number. Three? One? Two? Eight? All right, so you're close. It's less than ten then you're probably surprised, surprised that at a point in one of the drafts there were 130, almost 135 references to Indigenous peoples um, for the draft for the Sustainable Development Goals. And so July 19th, 2014 will be a day that I'll, that I'll always remember because that was the day that myself and um, Donica Lillichild from Irmis and Cree Treaty 6 uh, we slept on the UN floor to protect the last references to indigenous peoples in the SDGs. Because it went down from, there were 30 meetings before that in the open-ended working group. And you saw that number of references to indigenous peoples decline every meeting. Boom, boom, boom. And that final meeting of this open-ended working group, we had to hold the line. And that meeting went into overtime. They adjourned the meeting at like 2 a.m. for a pause and went to sleep at the UN floor just to make sure that whenever they get back to negotiations, we were there to protect the final references to indigenous peoples. The reason why I'm sharing that is that if ever there's a moment that exemplifies a need for representation of Indigenous peoples, as peoples, at the UN, that's the moment. That Indigenous peoples can fight for references to themselves, making sure that it's not just five, eight, or ten, but actually there's those 105 references to Indigenous peoples that are actually in the Sustainable Development Goals. So we're talking about Sustainable Development Goals right now, but it's also very important that we need to be there at the design phase, not as an as a after, after the fact, as a consultation, but that you're there when they're actually getting the idea of a sustainable development goals, or what's coming down in the fall is the summit of the future. Article 18 is super important, um, which, which I want to highlight, so the right to participate in decision-making processes that affect us. That doesn't mean that the UN is going to decide for us what it affects us. That means that we are going to decide which meetings that affect us. And we're there at the earliest stage possible. So the last, yeah, well today and yesterday, I heard a lot about sovereignty, decolonization, self-determination, self-government. And those are all, all very important contexts, all important objectives of not just the Métis National Council, Métis, or the Inuit, or the First Nations, but it's for these peoples all over, all over the world that, like kind of said, we're not NGOs. We're not non-governmental organizations. We've been there before political states, so why would we, we be an NGO? Sure, the UN is a club of states. You have member states. But 
the thing is, the first words of the UN Charter is, says, we the peoples. Well, matter of fact, we are people, so we should be at that table. I think as um, Chief Orrin Lyons said, said it very well, is that if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Or you're serving the menu. And that's what this enhanced participation process is all about. It's, it's in too much ensuring that indigenous peoples are at the table at matters that affect them. So this process is not just of the, the last 10 years. I think I can describe it very well. This is a process that is uh, at least 100 years to ensure that indigenous peoples are part of the family of nations at the decision-making level. Who here has um, a, is, uh, is a member of Frequent Flyer Plan? Uh, what's Aeroplan, uh, WestJet, like, just, just raise your hand. So there are tiers, right? You know, like, so you have, uh, you have normal elites uh, and then super elites or something. So imagine, I'm trying to make it relatable for you what an participation process is. So indigenous peoples can already participate at the Premier Forum on Indigenous Issues and Expert Mechanism on Rights of Indigenous Peoples as Indigenous Peoples organizations. That's super important because we're not NGOs, right? As peoples, as MNC, we're not peoples. Uh, we're not NGOs, sorry. And that's, that's good. That's what we'll have, that we'll continue to have. There are Indigenous peoples that have their own NGOs. That's also okay because there's this and geomodality, and as ECOSOC. But what's in between? Because after that, you have the member state, and you have a permanent observer status as well. But there's nothing here, there yet, that actually is good for indigenous people's governing institutions. And that's where NS participation well, comes in. To ensure that it's another layer on top to allow it for indigenous people to, to participate in all these meetings that, that, that affect them. And so this is, you know, like again, with Aeroplan, and this, it's getting to what's where decisions are being made at the General Assembly, at the Human Rights Council. Now, that, is, that requires negotiating. That requires lobbying. That requires a lot of hard work, because you're messing with something that is actually built for member states. However, we are also peoples. We're also um, very important to contribute to the work of, of the world. We're not there to complain, we're there to contribute to the work of, of the world. The thing is that obviously uh, we have some God's honest issues to, 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 to work on at the local level, um, emergency management and everything else, and you can't unfortunately cook and eat the UN Declaration. Um, you can't build houses with the paper of the UN Declaration. However, Whilst we're fighting for that, while we're trying to maintain a decent level of dignity for these peoples using the UN Declaration of Rights of Peoples, this is a process of hope for these peoples. To, to, for emancipation as an Indian self-governing institution with, 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 with member states. So, it's, so that, that, that's what we're trying to do for the next, well, we've been doing for a long, very long time and hopefully uh, it won't take a lot of time after this as well, but it's, it is a very uh, important process and that um, we can use all the help that we can get, obviously. So when we talk about roadmap, there's, um, there's the UN General Assembly in New York and there's the UN in Geneva, the Human Rights Council. And they all have taken upon, them, both have taken upon themselves to see like, all right, how are we going to do this? And that's participation. But that, if, that means that we have to have two campaigns, one in Geneva and one in New York. One that we have to deal with 54th member states and the other one we have to deal with all member states. So the roadmap requires a lot of finesse, making subtle but significant steps. The good thing is we're good at it as indigenous peoples. We've been doing that for decades, for one, over 100 years. The, the thing that we need to do right now is to ensure that we can continue building momentum. Because as much as we want it, as much as we have the support of Canada and some other countries, there are countries that do not like it. We have to be very honest about that. And the, 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 the thing that we need to do at this point 
and I think yesterday there was a there was a presentation that that said it very well is that those that are against the best thing that they can do is slow slow it down, make it inevitable, make it irreversible. So that is what we're trying to do for uh, for, uh, for the next couple of years, or well, with several several meetings that are up ahead. What might be of interest to you is that um, there's some interesting events coming up in New York. There's a World Conference on Indigenous People's Commemoration. This whole process started at the World Conference. So it is very, it could be interesting to say like, use that as an as a opportunity. It's like, hey, and as participation is super important, uh, we want this to be one of the fo main focuses the next coming years. You talked about the UN Declaration for, for quite a while. Well, in a couple of years, we'll, we'll get to the 20th anniversary of the UN Declaration in 2027. If you look at those two opportunities, that's a great opportunity to, as, in, to, as momentum, to create momentum towards making sure that this, that is, that this status become, becomes a reality. As we have to deal with a lot of these things, human rights violations all across the board, and as participation is something that creates a status for indigenous governments, self-governing institutions, judicial councils, uh, parliaments, assemblies, it can be this ray of light so that they can, from now and until the future, can know that, well, this, this is happening. But uh, at the international level, we, have a, we can have a voice at this, at this decision-making table. So, uh, in terms of roadmap, obviously you have to deal with member states, uh, but your, um, I would say like, your, well, your input is very much uh, valued. There's in Geneva and New York, we'll have, at, throughout this year, we have uh, several meetings. There will be an intersessional meeting of the Human Rights Council. Two meetings of those, those are gonna be super, very important. That will set the stage for um, what will be the mechanism that could do this accreditation for this, uh, for these, uh, for the status. What will be the criteria? Where can, go, where can these, these governments go to? Um, and what can they do? So in Geneva, we'll be setting the, the, we'll be setting the, the, the foundation for that. And in New York, we have to make sure that there's a process, that it continues, and that hopefully, I'm an optimist, um, hopefully, by when we celebrate the 20th anniversary of the UN Declaration of Rights of New Peoples, that one of the deliverables will be a status for indigenous governments at the highest possible level at the United Nations. Thank you. My friends, I hope you enjoyed this. Please consider to subscribe, to comment, and to share this video on your socials.